Uh, Jack, can you drop the slides? We're going live in a second. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, good afternoon, uh, delegates. Uh, welcome to day four of the MBA ICLE training and arbitration. Uh, today we have Jeff, uh, Greg Falkoff and Jack Bostin as the facilitators for today's session. And today we'll be discussing arbitration as a practice. I'll, I'll first start by introducing Greg. Greg Falkoff is a partner in the international arbitration practice uh, team of Mission de Raya. He had a particular focus on the effective resolution of disputes in the energy, resources, transport, engineering, infrastructure, and construction sectors, as well as international investment arbitration and public international law. Greg is a member of the ICC Global Commission for Arbitration and ADR, appointed by the ICC UK Committee the world's premier multi-jurisdictional forum for advancing the practice of international arbitration. He's the co-founder of a, and a former director of the Law Dispute Resolution, an independent arbitration institution that promotes quality, flexibility, and time and cost efficiency in the resolution of international disputes. Greg has represented both claimants and respondents in large complex international arbitrations, uh, what billions of dollars, and the four major arbitral institutions, including the ICC, LCIA, ICSID, CIATAC, and LMAA, as well as ad hoc arbitration proceedings. He also sits as an arbitrator, both as a party appointed and appointed by the main arbitration institutes as sole arbitrator in expedited or standard proceedings. Greg has acted for parties in commercial and investment arbitrations in a range of sectors, including construction, energy, infrastructure, transport, commodities, mining, and natural resources, real estate, telecoms, and international trade, state-to-state -state disputes, pursuant to public international law, including uh, conducting advocacy before eminent international tribunals and both uh, investors and state claimants in investment treaty arbitrations. Before joining Mission, Greg was a partner in international arbitration practice of a global law firm. Prior to his legal career, Greg qualified as a construction engineer and worked as a professional project manager on large complex construction projects in the UK and South Africa. Uh, Greg will be joined this afternoon by his associate, an associate in his firm, Jack Bostin. Um, it's my pleasure this afternoon, therefore, to welcome Greg and Jack to this afternoon's session. I'm also happy uh, that we have some other panelists here participating. Uh, I can see that Mrs. Fumi Robos is here. Um, I'm grateful to the coordinators, Akino Mishade and Rachel Osibo. Now, the floor is yours, Greg. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, if there are any issues with the sound, please do let me know. We can hear you. Thank you. Um, so welcome, everyone. You have had a number of sessions from my distinguished co-panelists, um, a number of sessions about arbitration theory, about the ideas behind arbitration, the principles of international arbitration. Could I ask people to please mute their, um, their, their, uh, their, their microphones? Thank you. <laughs> so you've had, we've had up till now, a number of excellent sessions. I've tuned into some of the sessions. I felt they were extremely good, um, really professional, very knowledgeable, detailed uh, sessions on the principles and the law and the ideas and the theories behind international arbitration. What we're going to do today 
is pull all of these together to explain international arbitration as practice, what we as lawyers do when we are practicing international arbitration. Uh, what we're going to do is myself and my colleague, Jack Burston, who is an associate in my, in my team at the International Arbitration Practice at Mishkan Dorea, we will essentially hold a conversation between the two of us. And that conversation will be to discuss the life cycle of an international arbitration. So we'll go through the various different steps of an international arbitration chronologically, starting right at the beginning before the arbitration is triggered. What are the initial steps to look at right from the start? Moving all the way through the different stages and the different steps and the chrono chronology as the international arbitration develops, as the dispute develops, moving all the way through to the hearing, then the award, and ultimately to enforcement of the award right at the end. Uh, we have a number of slides, and if I could please ask Jack to pull up those slides now. Uh, next one, please. Thank you. So, as I was saying, this is the introduction. What we will be doing is speaking through the life cycle of an entire international arbitration, primarily focusing between myself and Jack on the practical role that we as lawyers and yourselves as lawyers would take in various stages of the international arbitration. You can see some of those stages up on the screen before you, commencing the arbitration, formation of the tribunal, interim measures, et cetera, et cetera. While we are discussing this, it'll become evident that what we will also be discussing are the skills and qualities for successful arbitration lawyers. We won't address this directly, but the skills and the qualities that we will be discussing are those that will come out when we're highlighting the different roles of counsel as we move forward through the life cycle. The final point that we'll get to is getting into the profession, taking your first step into the profession. International arbitration is not something that's taught at all universities. It's not part of the standard law school and legal training curriculum. I get asked, Jack gets asked all the time, how do we take our first step? And once we've talked through the life cycle, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, if I could, if we could move on. So starting, um, and before we start with the initial considerations, could I just invite Jack, please, to jump in at any point? This, <laughs> this is a conversation. It's between the two of us. So Jack, welcome. Um, I'm looking forward, looking forward to sharing out my views with you and listening to your views as well. So starting with the initial considerations, this is essentially the similar position that one should take when starting a litigation. You need to understand what it is that you're doing. Where is the breach that you're looking for? Who bears the loss? What is the loss? These are absolutely critical issues particularly in the situation of an international arbitration. As you've heard in, your previous, in, your, in the previous lectures, international arbitration is a contractual choice. An arbitration can only be brought between the parties who have signed the arbitration clause themselves. You can't bring an international arbitration against anyone who's not a signatory. Now, for that reason, the question of where is the breach and who bears the loss are absolutely critical. Because if the breach has not been suffered, if, if the breach has been suffered by a non-signatory, or if the loss has been borne by a party who is not a signatory to the international arbitration, potentially you may not, not always, but you may not be able to bring the international arbitration. You may need to look through other means to, to gain redress for that loss. Obviously the most important question of all of this is how much, what is the loss? And that I think is something critical to bear in mind through all of this, through all of the arbitration, through all of the theory, through all of the practice, the most important thing is your client, and the most important thing is what ultimately is the loss that your client has suffered, or alternatively, what is the claim that your client is looking to avoid being held liable for? Ultimately, it's about money at the end of the day. So looking, go ahead, Jack. Um, so, you know, as a starting point, the primary duty we have is to our clients. <clears throat> and as a result of that duty, our job is to often tell clients news they don't like. So. It may be at the very outset, you, you realize that you may not even have an arbitration. So it's important to have those initial open discussions with the client, identify the issues. As Greg said, has there been a breach? Who's at fault? Where's the damage? Who suffered the damage? Is the arbitration clause defective? Um, we've often had situations where if you don't assess the arbitration clause right at the outset, 
where the cause is badly drafted. That's where the clients can sometimes spend substantive amounts of money arguing over procedural issues, which can obviously lead to delay and, and so on. I think that's critically important because the arbitration is so procedurally and legally quite complex. Clients ultimately end up spending a huge amount of money on lawyers arguing about jurisdiction issues. That can be avoided, firstly, if the arbitration clause is drafted properly. Um, this is not a session about drafting. You've had lectures about drafting the arbitration clause and the importance of that. But what this shows is if that initial pre-dispute stage, that contractual stage of drafting the arbitration clause, if that is wrong, a huge argument or uh, huge disputes can follow as regards just jurisdiction under the arbitration clause, which is the correct party. Um, no client wants to spend money on lawyers arguing about legal issues unnecessarily. Uh, first thing, get the arbitration clause right. And I think um, the bullet point down second from the bottom is use your counterparts. There's no point going through an arbitration with the cost, expense, distractions, time. No point if you end up with an award. So, you know, whether that's for want of assets or are there potential sovereign immunity issues. So it's important at the outset to investigate what those issues are, if there are any. No, 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 no. Sorry, could, I, could I ask all attendees to please put yourselves on mute? There are some distractions coming through. Thank you very much. Well, just a second, I think Jack will need to adjust his audio a bit. Jack. Okay. Thank yeah. you, Jack. Okay, so I'll pick up on, on while Jack is doing that, I'll pick up on that point. Um, the second last bullet point, the jurisdiction of the assets and can you enforce an award against a counterparty? Now that is, again, absolutely critical. There is no point in going through the entire arbitration process to obtain an arbitral award at the end of the day, which, has, um, which, which can be enforceable. The question is where and against whom do you enforce it? Does the specific counterparty named in the arbitration agreement does that counterparty have assets? Are the assets at a higher level in the company? Are the, are the assets hidden behind the corporate veil? There's no point in starting the arbitration until you know whether you can ultimately get money out of it. Um, and for that reason, asset investigation is critical right from an early stage. And we've had a number of examples in our firm where clients have come to us saying that they want to start an arbitration. We investigate the assets situation and ultimately it turns out that an arbitration is not the right route because ultimately there's no financial redress available against the particular signatory of the arbitration clause. Um, a final initial consideration is issues about limitation periods. The reason this is an initial consideration is because it is, a, it is an absolute defense. If you're outside of time on the limitation period, you can't get around that, not from an arbitration tribunal. You might potentially be able to get around that in court under certain reasons, but an arbitration tribunal, you will not get around a limitation period. So it's an absolute defense. You need to assess that. You need to assess whether any other strikeout defenses might be available before you bring the arbitration clause. Um, and 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 just just to um, just to add to that, it's you know limitation is almost always a binary position. Either the claim is in time or it's out of time. So it is it's often an easy win if. For instance, you've identified that you cut that you know someone has filed a request for arbitration, and you notice oh that you know that breach happened more than six years ago in England is the limitation. So identify those those sorts of issues at the outset, and it's an easy win. Because which does remind which is an absolute bar. Which does remind me that uh, throughout this, I will be taking on points that a claimant will advance in the arbitration and Jack will be taking on points that a defendant or a respondent will advance. Yes. In, this, in this situation, the claimant needs to make sure they don't fall into the trap of bringing a claim that's out of time. Similarly, the defendant has the opportunity to raise an immediate strikeout defense right at the start. Moving on. So here we look at some of the preliminaries. Uh, we'll canter through this fairly quickly. This slide covers the majority of um, sessions that have happened that that have taken place up to now. The first is uh, the first bullet point: the law of the seat overlaid with parties' choice of procedural rules. The key here is that arbitration, as we've mentioned, as we've been told before, arbitration is a choice. Um, the choice is governed by the law of the seat, and it's also governed by the parties' choice of procedural rules, whether they're Nigerian arbitration rules, whether they're ICC, their London Court of International Arbitration 
The point is the parties choose that. And with that choice comes a whole series of potentially chosen narrowness or na restrictions within those choices, but also particularly important on the point of practice in the arbitration is that arbitrators approach an arbitration quite differently from how courts and judges approach a litigation. The reason for that is arbitrators understand that they are there because the parties have chosen to be there. As the parties have chosen to be there, arbitrators generally, but not always, but generally offer more deference to what parties agree as regarding timing, as regards procedure. Therefore, if the parties do agree something, it's very rare for an arbitrator to say, no, the case needs to progress in the way the arbitrators want it, contrary from how the parties choose. Um, I mean, I, I can uh, I can take the next uh, what the bottom point actually I think is quite interesting is something that that we have to deal with a lot, which is the confidentiality of arbitration proceedings. And in international arbitration, there can be a culture clash between um, the common law and the civil law approach to confidentiality. And a good example of that is I'm working on a case at the moment where um, the other side is a Swiss law firm, and they're redacting a lot of their document production. And that's because they're used to litigating in the Swiss courts. So lawyers, parties, and arbitrators come from different legal traditions. And, you know, arbitration has its own language to deal with this. So, you know, th there are guides and accepted, rule, accepted rules and procedures and norms that um, counsel come into an arbitration need to be conscious of when they're approaching a case. And having a general understanding of those sorts of shared norms is really important um, to, to have a good case, but also to have the uh, arbitration run smoothly. Um, and I think often you end up in situations where you have counsel who are very good litigators make the mistake in thinking that arbitration is like very similar to litigation, but in front of a tribunal instead of a judge, but it isn't. And, and one of the reasons for that is, as Greg said, it goes back to party autonomy because the parties curate their own procedure. Um, on the point of confidentiality again there are multiple ways of looking at this we all say that arbitrations are confidential the reality in my view is that arbitrations are not usually litigated in court therefore the public nature of a litigation that might be in court is different from what will happen in arbitration so confidentiality of the arbitrations comes from it not being in court in some seats of arbitration for example the DIFC the confidentiality of arbitration itself, all the documents, all the witness statements, all the procedural elements, those in the DIFC, as an example, those are mandated to be confidential. In England, there's no mandatory confidentiality, it's an implied duty. In certain other jurisdictions, it's only the award itself which is confidential, rather than all of the pleadings and um, submissions that go prior to that. So, Confidentiality is something that needs to be taken into account. Uh, it's not always as cut and dried as everyone thinks, which is that all arbitrations are always confidential. There are a number of lacuna here. Another of those in certain jurisdictions, for example, the US, if one is looking to enforce an arbitration award, an award you've obtained from arbitration, and you take it to a US court to enforce over assets based in the US, the award then becomes public because it's a court document. So again, there are, there are a number of ways that confidentiality doesn't apply to the extent that we hope and that we often advise our clients that it does. And it's just something to be aware of. And, and, and there's also an, there's often an assumption from clients or, or from practitioners who don't deal with arbit international arbitration on their day-to-day -day basis that arbitration is completely confidential, uh, like Greg suggested. And actually, when they find out later on down the line, there are a lot of exceptions and there are circumstances where you know, parts of the arbitration are confidential or, or there are reasons for things be becoming public knowledge. So it's not it's not a given um, just because that even there is an implied duty that everything will remain confidential in an, in an, in, in an arbitration. And to come to, to come off to that, um, in, it, if there is a situation where, where there's specific confidentiality that is required in arbitration uh, because of the party autonomy point, Parties can agree that there's a specific uh, express duty applied by the arbitrator, some sort of a confidentiality ring. These are things we can get into as we, as we move forward. Uh, next slide, please, Jack. So where do we start? Um, 
commencing an arbitration, as we've already said, before you take any steps in the arbitration, the most important thing is to conduct your initial factual and legal investigation to understand where, where the breach lies, where the damage lies, who suffered, looking at potential evidence that you've got, looking at potential claims that we've got. Uh, from that respect, it's quite similar to litigation. How does an arbitration start? It starts by filing a written notice of arbitration. Um, some institutional rules call this a request for arbitration. Other institutional rules call this a notice of arbitration. The important point is that the request or the notice, it's only a trigger to start the process. It is not the statements of claim setting out the entirety of the claimant's claim. The primary point of the request or the notice of arbitration is to file, to start the arbitration, to appoint the arbitrator, to engage the beginning of the process so that the arbitrators and the tribunal can be appointed. Once they are appointed, the arbitration starts. But the one thing that does need to be included in the request for arbitration is a brief explanation of what the dispute is about so that the other party can see what the dispute is about and that the arbitration can then be started with, an, with a broad understanding as to what the dispute is. Um, the way to do that is, uh, as, as we've seen on, on the slide, you collect the documents there. Are the institutional rules, the ICC rules, the LCA rules, most of the other rules explain the minimum that is required within the request for arbitration, the notice of arbitration. What is also required, they explain dates, they explain timing, they also explain filing fees. There's usually a filing fee required for any institution. It's a brief administration fee. It's usually non-refundable. Um, £1,950, for example, for the, IC, for the LCIA, US dollars for the ICC. Those are non-refundable fees. And it's once the fees have been paid and the notice or the request for arbitration has been submitted, that the arbitration starts. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to add is that often you do have to check the rules carefully because the LCA, for instance, doesn't consider. So if you have limitation issues, just sending the request for arbitration saying, I've emailed that request or I filed the request doesn't necessarily, you know, stop your limitation clock because, it, for instance, the LCA don't start the arbitration or don't deem the arbitration to have started until the filing fee has been received. So it's just something to be careful about. You know, some you can you can pay it, you know, slightly after. But if you do have limitation issues, then it's always really important to check um, those, those sorts of things. And I think to add to the, to the request, you know, the written notice, it's not, it's your opening shot, but it's not your only shot. So obviously it triggers the, the dispute. The, the dispute is triggered under the request, but then the statement of claim can be very different. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we'll go on to look at statements of claim shortly. But the point is that the request doesn't have to pigeonhole you into a specific route. Um, and with my respondent hat on, you want to look out um, for uh, discrepancies between the statement of claim and the request. Is the claimant now advancing an entirely different cause of action or a claim that they've never raised or mentioned before? You know, is there any contractual estoppel from them advancing any particular claims? So it's really important as a respondent receiving a notice of arbitration, checking that carefully, and then hold it, looking at that later down, on down the line and seeing whether that is, that is consistent with their pleaded case later on. Are they advancing something completely different? If so, that may be an issue, especially if there are limitation issues. That's an interesting point. Um, my firm has just been approached by a client who received a notice of arbitration filed five years and 364 days after the contract was signed. So it's one day prior to the end of the six year limitation period. Now the notice of arbitration that we received, my client, that our client received was very, very vague. It was unclear exactly what the dispute was, but but it was very clear that what they were, what the other side is trying to do is get something started prior to the limitation period expiring, which means that we don't have an automatic defense to raise as a limitation defense. We will now have to argue this in the arbitration. As Jack had said, there might be some discrepancies between the request for arbitration and ultimately the statements of claim that then gets filed. The point is the other side have triggered the dispute. And once they've triggered the dispute, the, um, the limitation clock the six year limitation period stops ticking. Um, we will we'll need to see whether they have the ultimate dispute that they've brought is indeed the same dispute that they've actually triggered or if it's entirely different. But that's an example where um, the vagueness of the request for arbitration actually works in favor of the claimant in that situation. A couple of other points to notice on commencing an arbitration. 
certain jurisdictions require a power of attorney for counsel, quite often civil law jurisdictions. Um, Jordan is one of those. And the reason I mentioned Jordan is because it also goes to the second point, the specific requirements of the jurisdiction. I've recently done an arbitration seated in Amman in Jordan. Now there, there's a specific nationality requirement that the lead counsel for each party needs to be a Jordanian registered lawyer. Um, for my client, that was possible. We had Jordanian counsel. For the other party's clients, that was very difficult because their lawyers did not have Jordanian counsel. Ultimately, in that situation, neither party really wanted to be before the courts of Jordan as courts of the seat if there was an issue. So the parties agreed to move the seat of arbitration elsewhere. Uh, it's an example of party autonomy. It's one of the most fundamental things, as you've heard, is the seat of arbitration. The parties can agree to move the seat. There's no issue with that, provided the parties agree. Um, if I can add, actually, we we, um, we went we counted through it, but the pre-arbitration conditions, something that's come up in, in my practice recently, is uh, we had to file a request for arbitration because of, there was a limitation issue, and there were um, there were certain pre-arbitration steps which needed to have been taken, and now there is a, there is a dispute about whether or not the claimant complied with those pre-arbitration steps. So it's very very important to just check the whole contract and make sure that there's nothing tucked away there, which suggests you know do you have to go to mediation first. Oh no, I'm up against limitation. I should have gone to mediation, or and and you know these can cause all sorts of problems, and it, they can affect, as a matter of English law, affect the admissibility of the claim. They won't normally affect the jurisdiction of the tribunal, but you don't want to be getting in a dispute whether or not the jurisdiction of the tribunal has been affected because you've skipped out a step in the pre-arbitration procedure. So I just wanted to add to that. Thank you. Next one. So now, um, once the request of the notice of arbitration has been filed with the claimant submitting or nominating their arbitrator. Um, we then move to the formation of the tribunal from in, in my view, this is absolutely this is absolutely critical. Um, Jack, do you want to talk through what some of the some of the factors to consider? I, I think the overriding thing is that the internal dynamics of the tribunal are are key. Um, you nominate someone who you want to be work collaboratively with with at least one other member of the tribunal, if not both. Um, and I think you know what you want to bear in mind, all of these factors, which we've let, set out on the slides, um, the subject matter is very important. Does your arbitrator have enough experience? Um, what's their personality like? Are they collaborative or are they more of a, a lone wolf? Um, have you instructed them before, either as counsel or as an arbitrator? Is the claim particularly complex or is it straightforward? And it's also legitimate to have discussions with your nominated arbitrator as to who they would work with. Um, and if they're president, you know, you would want someone that they've worked with before. You want to have confidence in them. And, you know, all sophisticated international arbitration practitioners will take the same approach because you want to create a good tribunal that works well together, is properly qualified, and uh, also understands the dispute from a commercial perspective. Um, when picking an arbitrator, you know, you're trying to hit a range of factors. I think it, it's tempting where there's there's an issue which is really important and you want to have an arbitrator say who is from a certain country or speaks a particular language or has a particular interest in a particular sector that there's a, a danger that they may end up as the odd one out and for instance you know um if you have an english law contract but you just appoint a civil lawyer for one reason or another that could be risky if they end up being outnumbered on english law issues and, and may not have as much much influence on the tribunal as you would like so you know, it, it's it's not an exact science. There's no there's no kind of hard and fast, but it's about you know picking someone or picking a, a list of people who you feel will, will will best keep the balance on that tribunal and and best um, keep the dynamics of that tribunal in check. I think that's absolutely critical. Um, I'll give an example of this. I a number of years ago acted for a client who was a Middle Eastern state-owned entity. Now, that state-owned entity unfortunately got into a number of disputes, and they had a policy of nominating an arbitrator from their own jurisdiction. Uh, it's not a particularly common jurisdiction, so the pool of arbitrators that they could choose from were necessarily limited by their own internal policy. In the dispute that I'm thinking of, the opposing party appointed somebody who was an extremely well-known arbitrator. I bet many people on this call will know that person's name. So you had a tribunal created of, on the one hand, somebody 
from the Middle Eastern jurisdiction who was not particularly well known in the world of arbitration. On the other hand, somebody extremely well known. These two individuals then had to choose the president of the tribunal. Obviously, the more, more well-known international arbitration arbitrator was able to choose a president of the international of the tribunal who was equally as well known. That meant immediately that two people knew each other very well on the tribunal. And the third one, the Middle Eastern arbitrator from the state-owned entity, didn't know either of them. Um, and this this was very, very obvious as the hearing advanced. And it became quite obvious that the two that knew each other were ultimately not paying as much attention as we had hoped to the one who didn't know the other two. And that ultimately came out in the, in the award where a dissent was issued by the Middle Eastern arbitrator. And unfortunately that was overruled by the two other arbitrators that knew each other that had a much better working relationship. I'm not saying that anyone was biased. I'm simply saying that it was, in the way that the arbitration deliberations happened, I can assume that the president just by nature of who he is more familiar with, the language of the discussions, the way the discussions happened, I would expect in the deliberations, he was more open to listening to the arguments put forward by somebody that he was more familiar with and more comfortable with, as opposed to somebody that he'd never met who he didn't, didn't understand the world that he came from. Uh, it's unfortunate, but it does happen. So the dynamics within the tribunal probably the one single thing that is absolutely key for the entire for the entire arbitration and we've seen time and time again when those dynamics fall apart the tribunal you may have lost the tribunal and that that is a that's always a difficulty for the um, for the arbitration I, I think just to touch on, we're not really going to be discussing um, investor state arbitration, but there are, of course, in that arena, certain arbitrators who are known as, as arbitrators will get appointed on behalf of states and others who are very kind of claimant heavy. So, it, you know, th there are different considerations depending on whether you're in a commercial arbitration or an investor state arbitration where you may want a, an arbitrator who, for instance, is always or, or tends to be more sympathetic to states, or if, if you're a state as a respondent, or if you're a claimant, you may want to find an arbitrator who seems who's a bit more claimant friendly um, in that context. Thank you. Move on. Um, Jack, do you want to? Sure. Take... Yeah, uh, interim measures. Um, we all know the aim of interim measures is to preserve the rights of a party, and it's always pen tends to be always pending final resolution of a dispute, although that can. Um, you know, you can have some final measures. Um, what do you want from your interim measure? Uh, there are a few reasons people, parties go for that. You try to maintain the status quo. Uh, you're protecting evidential rights. You're preventing frustration of a future award or, or an award on costs. Uh, is there specific performance you need under the contract? Um, and just to take the English law example, the interim relief available from a tribunal can be in order for security for costs. And that will be both a power granted them under most institutional rules, but also under the English Arbitration Act, that's section 38, and directions in relation to the inspection, preservation, custody or detention of the subject matter, if there's a particular asset in dispute, again, that's section 38. Um, the tribunal is empowered under English law to make interim awards, including a provisional order for the payment of money. Um, and then looking at, um, uh, you know, interim relief available from a tribunal, it, that may be an anti-suit injunction to restrain, restrain court proceedings in breach of the arbitration agreement, um, taking steps to terminate other proceedings in other jurisdictions. And as we've said at the top, timing is key. So some institution that may have rules about when these can be raised. So always check the rules, check your procedural orders, um, because it may say you can only raise it within a certain amount of time after becoming aware. Um, and also, you you know, if, if the aim is to protect evidential rights or preserve assets or prevent asset stripping, you know, the quicker you move, the more likely you are to preserve the thing that you're trying to preserve. Um, also check, does the tribunal have the power to order the measure that you're requesting? Some jurisdictions may not have um, a lot of the powers that you may have in some in other jurisdictions. So um, I think it's also important to bear in mind that when you when you are in the in the middle of an arbitration, especially early stage, um, the tribunal may not have formed a view of the dispute. Uh, they may not want to take a position against one party or another. And often that means that if you're asking a tribunal for something that would require them to issue something very onerous, 
they may not do it because they don't want to be seen as taking a, a early position adverse to one party or another and they need to remain neutral um so it's also about being kind of conscious of what you're asking for is it particularly onerous are you more likely to get similar relief from a court um or an emergency arbitrator if the tribunal hasn't been formed yet um and um you know tribunals are generally reluctant to delay things um so um I would say that if you do get knocked back, um, don't feel that you can't make a request later on down the line. If, if for instance, you're applying for security for costs, um, you know, you may get knocked back initially, but it doesn't mean that, that if circumstances change, that um, it's not open to you to, to make that application for interim measures. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, and a good example um, of differences between um different jurisdictions is that there are some measures which are available and more common in common law jurisdictions and not so common in civil law so for instance the swiss courts will rarely order security for costs but you are in a different circumstance when you're in a tribunal that's seated in london so there are different depending on the seat of your arbitration and the jurisdiction you're in it, it may it may affect what interim measures you can you can apply for and i think this is the the, the bigger picture here regarding interim measures is about case strategy and what is it that you're trying to do during the arbitration, which will put your client in a better position than they were previously? Um, there, there are a whole series of considerations to think of. The primary of those, as Jack has mentioned, is, in my view, the fact that the tribunal is usually more willing to order interim measures that preserve the status quo rather than ordering interim measures that change the status quo. So for example, if you're having a dispute regarding the sale of shares and party A entered into a contract to sh sell shares to party B, A then refused to sell, B wanted to buy but didn't, B has brought an arbitration against A for breach of the share sale agreement. In a situation where, for example, A is now looking to sell the shares to somebody else while the arbitration is going on, a tribunal may in that situation be a lot more willing to issue an order preventing A from shelling, selling the shares to a third party because that would change the entire nature of the dispute. It may mean that B is then no longer able to ask for specific performance for the shares to be transferred. B then may only be able to ask for damages because A no longer has the shares. So just one example of what are you asking for and where what is what you are asking for something that the tribunal would realistically be willing to order. I've had situations sitting as a, uh, as a, either a sole arbitrator or as a member of a tribunal where one party asks for an interim measure, which is essentially looking to foreclose the entire dispute. Uh, there's no chance that a tribunal will order an interim measure that then results in the dispute becoming a fait accompli. That just that that will never happen, and it makes you wonder why tribunal why arb, uh, arbitration lawyers. Look to uh, look to ask for those for those issues because they obviously the tribunal is not going to jump earlier than they need to, particularly prior to having heard all of the issues, all of the evidence. The tribunal isn't going to take an early decision that can change things. What they will do is take an early decision that can maintain things. Um, a second strategy point here is whether you approach a tribunal for an interim measure, or whether you approach a local court for an interim measure. The issue with approaching a tribunal, ultimately, the powers of the tribunal are limited only to the two parties before the tribunal, to those two parties who are signatories to the arbitration clause. That's the first point, that the tribunal can't order anything against a third party. The second point is that more often than not, tribunal orders for interim measures may not necessarily be compulsorily binding on the parties who they order them to do. So a tribunal can, in my earlier example, a tribunal can order party A not to sell the shares because the shares are in dispute, but that doesn't physically stop party A from selling the shares. Party A may make a strategy decision that it's better for them or it's more in their interests to sell those shares even though the tribunal has ordered them not to do so. In a situation like that, it might be better to go to a court to get a court order preventing party A from selling the shares, because in that situation, party A would then be in contempt of court, potentially even the directors of party A might be personally in contempt of court if there was an order 
from the court preventing them from selling the shares. There's an example of where a tribunal's order, whilst relevant within the arbitration, may ultimately not have the teeth that you need as, um, as party B in that situation. So there are situations where you might be, it, it might be better to avoid the tribunal entirely, rush to the local court to get an order and then revert to the tribunal to explain why it is that you have, um, that you have to avoid the tribunal and go directly to the court. There's a third point here, which is the emergency arbitrator. Um, so an emergency arbitrator exists prior to the formation of the arbitration tribunal. That's a situation where um, you have an arbitration clause, something is about to happen in the dispute between the parties, which requires an emergency immediate interim relief. It will take too long to constitute the normal tribunal. It's 28 days from your side, 28 days from the other side, plus further time for the appointment of the, of the tribunal chair. It could take two to three months to constitute the tribunal. As a party that has signed an arbitration agreement, you need emergency relief immediately. Some, most of the institutional rules provide for an emergency arbitrator. Usually the procedure is that an emergency arbitrator should issue their decision within either one week or 15 days of being, um, being, being appointed. But even then with an emergency arbitrator, you, you face the same issue that an arbitrator's, emergency arbitrator's award is not necessarily binding Whilst it might be difficult for the party, it doesn't compel the party to, um, to, to comply. So again, you're faced with the decision, do you go to the court, do you go to the emergency arbitrator? In some situations, a court might require a party to go before a tribunal before a court will issue their own order. In other situations, a court would be presumably on urgency. A court would be happy to issue an interim measure, even if the tribunal hasn't been approached or if the tribunal hasn't been constituted or the emergency arbitrator hasn't. These are all strategy issues to be discussed and discussed. Um, there's multiple different ways of approaching this. Moving on to the next one. So now we've started the arbitration. We've got the arbitration tribunal set up. We may have applied for various, various interim measures. We may have gotten, some, gotten somewhere. Um, we're now looking at the meat of the arbitration. This is the important part of the arbitration itself. The written submissions are where the parties put forward their claims and their defenses. As we said at the start, your request for arbitration or your notice of arbitration, it triggers the dispute, but it does not tie you into making one or two specific claims or specific defenses. There are certain institutional rules and the ICC is one of them where you are tied in in accordance with the terms of reference. That's specific to the ICC. I don't think we need to discuss it here. But the point is that the written submissions, your statements of claim, is the first opportunity to set out the claimant's full entire claim. And the statement of defense is the first opportunity for the respondent to set out the full entire defense. The question then is, how is this done? There are two general ways in international arbitration um, to do your written submissions. And they're called either pleading style or memorial style. Pleading style is similar to common law litigation that we all know, where parties submit their pleadings. One party submits the pleading, first pleading, the other party submits its defense, then the first party submits its reply. After the pleadings have been filed between each other, then both parties later on submit their witness evidence, their reply witness evidence, their expert evidence, and their reply expert evidence. So that's quite similar to court litigation. That's pleading style. The alternative is called memorial style, and this is most common in international arbitration. It follows a civil law approach rather than a common law court approach. Memorial style is where you submit your statements of claim or your statements of defense with everything that you rely on, all your witness statements, all your evidence, all your expert reports, all your documents, everything is all submitted at exactly the same time on exactly the same date. So that would mean that you'd submit a memorial, which is your statements of claim, which will contain all okay. of your legal authorities. It'll contain all, your, all, your, all of your legal argument. It'll contain your factual argument. It'll contain all of your witness statements, which are submitted at the same time, all of the expert reports, which are submitted at the same time, and every single document. Now, memorials are useful because it sets out the entire case in one 
in, in, in one go. Everything is there in front of you. Sometimes they're not so useful because it is only as the shape of the case progresses that certain issues are either decided to be irrelevant or are highlighted less or more so. Um, and if you're submitting everything all at once, you might be focusing on the wrong thing. Um, so either the pleading style or the memorial style either have their approach, depending on the case, depending on the arbitrators, depending on counsel. Um, the best strategy very much depends on what you want from your claim, how, how the shape of the claim, how the claim is going to advance. There isn't a single right or wrong answer. Um, the most important thing in all of these is do you have all the evidence that you need? Do you have all your witness evidence? Do you have all your expert evidence? Do you have all your documentary evidence? Even if you're doing a pleading style submissions where you only submit your statements of claim and you follow at a later point with witness and expert evidence, even if you're doing that, all your, you should collate all of your evidence at the start so that you can ensure that your pleadings match the evidence that you're later filing. Obviously, if you're doing memorial style where everything is filed at the same time, you certainly do need to have all the witnesses, all the experts and all the documentary evidence at the same time as you are pleading your memorials. Um, there's a lot of strategy to discuss, but I'll pass over to Jack for other comments on this. So, I mean, that that uh, bullet point third from the bottom, which is the front load difficult issues, this is a this is pure strategy, which is you may have an indication either because the respondent has put it in their response to the notice, or it's something they've advanced before the tri before the arbitration started, or you just kind of have anticipated. You sort of know what they what what defenses they might run. As claimant, you have an important decision, which is, do you front load a difficult legal issue or a difficult factual issue and try and deal with it up front? Or do you wait for the other side to raise it? And there's never a right or wrong answer to do with that. It, it, it sort of depends on the on the issue of fact or law. And you know, I, I've been in, in an international arbitration recently where we knew the other side was going to run a very particular argument. Um, the argument was that the... Uh, contract was void for mistake and mistake is a very odd concept of English law but um, we figured it was the best thing to do was to front load it set up what our case is on mistake and why it didn't apply and what that means is you don't want to just set up all the hurdles for the other side to jump over but you need to also deal with um, issues which are difficult so it's again it's striking a balance um, and choosing when to raise your, your you know your best arguments and it may be that you have weak arguments or you have difficult issues that you need to deal with, but it's important to deal with them rather than ignore them or just wait for the other side to raise them. Um, and I think procedural timetables, we didn't really discuss that, but that's also important. You know, is this case really complicated? Are you going to need eight weeks to do your memorial, you know, bearing in mind all of the points Greg raised? You know, do you have, how many witnesses do you have? Do you have 10 witnesses? You know, how long, how long are their witness statements going to be? Is, is the time that you've allocated, and bearing in mind that most arbitrations tend to work, timetables work backwards from the hearing, you know, is there enough time for everything? Is there enough flex in the timetable? So when you are at the outset sorting out the procedural timetable, just, it, again, it's important to think about written submission quite early on because that is, as Greg says, that's the core of the arbitration. That's the most important bit, arguably one of the most important bits. So again, you know, it, it's making sure that you have enough time uh, to, uh, to prepare those those submissions. Um, on the issue of front loading difficult issues, I think that's a, that, that again that comes to strategy, as Jack has mentioned. Um, an alternative example, just to, to to drive home the point as to how these could be very different. Um, I have a case at the moment where my client is claiming that the other side should have released a construction performance bond a number of years ago, but failed to do so. And contractually, they failed to do so, and they have no defense. They should have released it, but they're not doing so. We have a sense of what we think their defense might be, and it's a specific legal defense. Um, we submitted, we're doing this memorial style, not pleading style. So we'd submitted our statements of claim explaining throughout the statements of claim why contractually the other side does not have a contractual basis to continue to hold the performance bond and they should release it. We have taken a strategy approach not to address in advance what we think their, um, their, their, their legal defense is going to be. 
We'd rather wait to see them plead their legal defense, the opponents plead their legal defense, before we address it. Um, the reason for that is because we felt that if we approach this in advance and we raise the point as to why their legal defense doesn't apply in our statement of claim, that would then give them an opportunity to explain why we were wrong. So we would rather allow them to put forward their legal defense. Our response would then address as to why they're wrong. So again, there's just strategy issues as to whether you front load difficult issues or you wait for the other side to raise. We've, we've had a question come in, which I think might be helpful to answer now, which is um, from Gabriel, which is what really constitutes memorials and how is that handled procedurally? I mean, I could answer the, the second bit, which is that often there is a fight about whether to have memorials or pleadings. And I've definitely been in an arbitration recently where um, we were saying we want memorials, i.e. we want to have um, the uh, one document which has all your legal arguments all your factual arguments, together with your witness statements and all your um, exhibits that you want to rely on. And the other side said, no, 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 no. We want pleadings. We want to have an, ex ex we don't understand your case properly. You need to set out your case in a pleading, which is a, a, a kind of very uh, a limited and quite structured way. And then we will, when we see that, we will understand your case. We will respond. Then we will have exchange of witness statements. And there was a fight. We had a whole hearing about whether it was more appropriate to have memorials or pleading style um, submissions. And in the end, the tribunal decided that they would have pleadings because it, they considered it suited the particular facts of the case uh, or, or procedurally. So often the parties are in agreement and it kind of depends who your counterpart is. And other times um, it, it, it won't be on agreement and the tribunal may have to make a decision about it. So um it, it kind of it kind of depends and again that i think that situation i was talking about was down to the legal traditions of the solicitors so we are an in international arbitration team we are very used to doing memorials and the other side was very used to doing english litigation and had a barrister who presumably preferred to do pleadings so i think that was the reason they were trying to go for pleadings rather than memorials and in the end for one reason or another the tribunal decided that actually memorials was not appropriate so procedurally, that's how it's handled, is either the parties agree or it goes to the tribunal to make a decision on it. And I think, Jack, you raise an interesting point here, which is the language of international arbitration. Um, international arbitration is not, is not litigation, but it can be. Hmm. Um, it can be litigation where all participants are from a similar legal tradition, all our former Commonwealth countries all have a similar common law approach. For example, all understand how common law litigation happens. In that situation, it's fairly common to under, for everyone to be speaking a similar language, not in the sense of words, but in the sense of concepts. Where you have the true international arbitration and you have parties from completely different parts of the world who speak different languages, come from completely different legal traditions, completely different cultural traditions. In that situation, in my view, it's absolutely critical that both parties appoint lawyers who are proper international arbitration practitioners. And the reason I say that is because international arbitration in some ways, this may sound trite, but international arbitration in some ways almost has its own language. When we're talking about memorials, when we're talking about submissions, when we're talking about hot tubbing of witnesses. These, the, the, all of these concepts have a specific understanding in international arbitration, which might be different from the same term being used in local litigation. And in an international arbitration, when all the parties are speaking the same procedural language, whilst the dispute can still be extremely hard fought and parties don't give an inch and it gets very disputed, the importance is that we're all speaking the same language. We all understand what the requirements are of each other. We all understand what the issues are of each other. And a lot of what we're speaking about today is explaining what that international arbitration language is in relation, for example, to procedural submissions or written submissions or various other issues. But the, the important point I think here is that there is a many different ways to approach this, but where it's truly international, there is generally a shared understanding of what that means within an international arbitration and it's quite different from litigation um we, we've had one question on right of reply in memorial style so just to make it clear you have a if you're claiming you you do your memorial 
then um, the respondent will do their counter memorial, then you will have a reply, and then you'll have a rejoinder. So each side will normally get two rounds of submissions. And if there's a counterclaim, there may be a, a, an extra submission on, on the defense to counterclaim. But yes, there is always a right to, there's almost always a right of reply. I mean, again, it's party autonomy. So parties decide that actually they don't want right to reply and they just want very, very, you know, one round of submissions. You can do that. But traditionally, yes, you would have each part party would have a right of reply. Um, and in, in the big cases, the witnesses also have the right of putting in a second witness statement in response to the first one from the previous from the previous round, as do the experts. So in the largest cases, you would have four sets of memorials. Your first memorial is a statement of claim, for example, three witness statements, two experts, 100 different documents. The second memorial then is the defense, which is the respondent's first right of reply. They would also put in three or four witnesses two experts, probably because it's unusual to have a defense on a third expert where the first first ex, first um, statement of claim doesn't have, has only two experts, and all the documents they rely on. So that's the second round submission. The third round submission is the right of reply of the claimant responding to the second, responding to the defense. In that situation, if the claimant's witnesses and experts wanted to say something further, they would have the right to do so, put in, in additional evidence, if you go to the point of front-loading difficult issues, in your statements of claim, you might be silent on certain issues. And then that allows you in your reply, as the claimant, your third the third round submission, to raise those issues. And for that reason, the respondent has a second right, right, right of reply, which is ultimately the fourth submission, which is the rejoinder. Um, that comes right at the end. And again, that is the ability to put forward a final fourth memorial, additional witnesses, or additional witness statements, additional expert reports, and additional documentary evidence. So this can get slightly unwieldy. It can get quite large. If all the parties agree, it can also be quite short. You could agree, for example, to limit your memorials to 50 pages. You can agree, for example, to have no more than two witnesses each and no more than one expert each. All of these things are discussed at the start, and that goes to the final point, the procedural timetable. The point there, does your timetable give you enough time to prepare? But now that I'm thinking of it, there's actually a preceding step that we should add in, which is to discuss and agree with the other side what the procedural timetable will look like. And the reason for that is because once you know what the procedural timetable will look like, you know what the shape of the dispute is. And again, it becomes a strategy discussion as to whether you want the dispute to be large, whether you want it to be limited. Obviously, one party usually wants the dispute to be all expansive. One party wants it to be very limited, that's usually the case, and quite often you'll have a case management conference, a CMC, with the tribunal once they are constituted, prior to any pleadings or memorials being submitted, and at that case management conference, both parties will put forward their position as to why the dispute on one hand should be wide or on the second hand should be narrow, and then the tribunal will, will ultimately decide. When a tribunal makes that decision, in my experience, if the tribunal consists of former judges, they are probably more willing to be interventionist and they are probably more willing to be to actively narrow the issues between the parties. If the tribunal consists of um, lawyers who are not former judges, possibly lawyers not from a common law tradition, they might be willing to allow as wide as possible because it's the party's dispute, party autonomy, parties can do what they wish. So it, again, this is an example as to why the composition of the tribunal is absolutely critical, because the shape of the dispute can be very different depending on who the composition of the tribunal is. Um, I don't I don't want to linger on this slide for too long, but we had another question, which I think may be worth briefly dealing with, which is <clears throat> how can one avoid carrying over litigation style brief writing and written submissions into international arbitration? And I don't think there's an easy answer to that, but it, it's a, and I'm, Greg, you, I don't know if you agree with me, but it's a, it is a, pretty much a question of practice and and experience and working with international arbitration lawyers who are used to um, that style. You know, it is a style of writing. It's a style of of um, argument, uh, and it is very different from legal uh, from litigation style uh, briefs. Um, so, um, you know, the, the and, and, and there's another kind of sub question, which is what is the panel looking out for? Greg, with your arbitrator hat on, may, may answer this, but it's about being as crisp and concise and clear as possible. You know, if, if your if your memorial needs to be 150 pages, you know, are you setting out, you know, are you are you just throwing everything out there or are you making your the case 
clear for the tribunal to understand. Um, so yeah, I don't know, Greg, if you have any thoughts on that before we move on. I think that's that, that's extremely important. And thank you for the questioner who asked that question. What is the tribunal looking for? The key, I, I think, to being an arbitration lawyer and probably also being a litigation a litigation counsel, the key is to put yourself in the shoes of the arbitration tribunal. What are you asking for them and what are you expecting them to do? If what you were doing is giving them a huge amount of information, extremely dense information, very, very long paragraphs, really convoluted discussions, you're going to lose your arbitration tribunal. You want to be very clear, very brief, very concise. The best memorials and the best pleadings we see are those that have a lot of space between the text in the pages, are those that use bullet points, are those that remove all of the extraneous words, remove all of the unnecessary sentences. You don't need to make the same point three or four or five times. The best memorials that I've seen are quite simply an opening paragraph or a couple of pages saying, this is what I'm going to say, then setting out everything that is to be said, and then a closing submission, this is what I have said. Um, make the points up front. And also the other thing that I think personally from reading numbers of different memorials from uh, various council, signposting within a memorial is extremely important. Signposting in terms of headers, in terms of subheaders, in terms of having a very, very clear structure. This memorial will start to address the claimant's legal claim, then we will go on to the factual issues, then the memorial will address the, the quantum. When we get to quantum, this is, the, this is the section of quantum. This section of quantum consists of three heads of damages, head A, head B, head C. Each head of damages is subdivided into two or three or four different areas. Structure, I think, is critical for all of these things. Um, now with the memorial style, when you're putting in all the witness evidence and all the expert evidence and all the documentary evidence at the same time, that allows one to take a very structured approach. And if you don't, you're ultimately giving a huge amount of information which isn't easy to wade through. But if you can take a very structured approach with a large amount of information for the memorials, I think that's massively helpful for the tribunal. And half your job is done because ultimately the job of counsel is to convince the tribunal that you are right and the other side is wrong. And if you're able to get your point clearly and concisely across to the other to the tribunal and in a way that is memorable, half your job is already done at that stage. Um, okay, we'll move on, shall we? Please. Now we get to the important points. Witness evidence. The slide after this is expert evidence, so we'll deal with witness evidence first. It goes to the point that I've just mentioned, the first bullet point. It's not just talking about a chronology of events. Which witness evidence must be persuasive and it must be believable. The witness themselves must be telling the story and they must be telling a relevant story story which can't simply be shown from the documents themselves because the memorial itself can simply point to sentence one paragraph two sentence three paragraph four you can you can pull together a story without putting in forward any witness evidence you can pull together a story simply from having the documents but quite often witness evidence adds context it adds color but it's important that what the witness is doing is not simply talking through the documents otherwise what's the point of the witness you need to, the witness needs to add something more than that. And it needs to be in the witness's own words, which is essentially to tell the story from a personal level. And it's that personal level, why this dispute has affected me. I am the chairman of this company. My company has been hard done by for this and this and this reasons. These are the effects of the dispute. This is what the other side has done to me. This is what they, we had expected from them. This is the relationship we entered into. This is, the, this is how the relationship didn't work. These sorts of issues, I think, are critical because at the end of the day, the arbitral tribunal ultimately is human. They're lawyers, lawyers are very, very curious people. As the arbitrator, if you can understand the context to the dispute, it makes it much easier to understand what's going on behind the dispute and what the issues were. If you don't understand the context, making a decision is much more difficult. Um, and and uh, you can see that there's that the technical explanations of a project is not all witness statements are about telling a story. Sometimes they're about um, explaining something that's very complicated. So often if you have a, a construction dispute or you have a huge oil and gas project or something offshore, 
it's important for the tribunal to understand what technically went on in the project. So that is all you know witnesses who can speak to, you know, how a crane operated or how a drill works are as important as the as the, you know a witness statement from a chairman who's explaining what 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 he did and why on that date and why he sent this email and why he had that meeting. So often your witnesses you have witnesses who who are there to technically explain the dispute um, or technically explain the project. Um, and I think um, the point at the bottom, witness preparation, um, you know, this is um, depending on what legal tradition you're from, um, it can affect uh, how you can prepare a witness for a hearing or for, for cross-examination. Um, and it's really important to be careful of your professional obligations. Now, there is a difference between, we won't kind of go into it because it's a whole, you could spend a whole day talking about it on its own, but there's a difference between witness familiarization uh, and witness uh, preparation. And some jurisdictions like the US, um, are it, it's it's not as cut and dry, but there, there are circumstances where a witness can be prepared a lot, a lot more and a lot more extensively than uh, as English solicitors, we can prepare our witnesses. And that again, you have that culture clash. So you can have a witness who um, is um, been prepared by US lawyers who has basically been instructed how to answer questions. But as English solicitors, we are restrained into what in what we how we can familiarize a witness. So um, uh, uh, our regulatory obligations prevent us from uh, asking a witness direct questions to prepare for the hearing about their evidence. It has to be more generic and more general. Now it's a gray area in arbitration because is your you know uh, as an English lawyer uh, we often do uh, arbitrations where the seat isn't in England. So we have an arbitration at the moment where the seat is in Geneva. And so that so although the seat is elsewhere, our English regulatory obligations will prevent us from uh, preparing a, a witness um, as if you you know compared to other jurisdictions. So again, check your professional obligations. What do they require you to do? It's not necessarily where the dispute is, but what rules govern your behaviour in, in terms of how you deal with witnesses. And I think that that is an important point, particularly on the cross cultural and the international element. Um, just to pick up what you said, Jack, about U.S. lawyers. My understanding of US bar rules in many states is that if you, as a US lawyer, if you don't prepare your witness properly, you are being negligent. As an English lawyer, if you prepare your witness to the level that you would if you were a US lawyer, you would be in breach of your professional obligations. So those are two completely contrasting require, legal re professional requirements, which means that where an English law English lawyers are up against American lawyers in an international arbitration, the witnesses get prepared very differently. That requires a lot of skill from the cross-examiner to pull that out. And as a cross-examiner, you should know, if you've done your homework, you should know or you should get a sense as to how the witness you're cross-examining has been prepared. You should be able to bring that out in the cross-examination to the extent that if you think it's relevant, then you should highlight it to the tribunal so that the tribunal can either understand that the witness has been prepared, therefore he's giving prepared answers, therefore the answers that he's giving are not true, or alternatively, the witness has been prepared such that he feels confident and he feels com comfortable and he's able to speak. So there are many different ways of approaching it. Um, Greg, we've had a couple of questions come in. I wonder whether I'm keeping one eye on the clock. Do we do we want to move on? I'm just conscious of the of we have a, f a, f a few slides more to get through. Or are you happy to kind of talk linger on witnesses for a little bit longer? Yeah, let's go because I think if there are questions on these issues, let's deal yeah. with them. So, so someone's asked the witness: uh, Can it be said that the witness evidence in chief, as in litigation, is the same with that of arbitration? So and generally, the answer for that is yes, but not always. Yes. Um, evidence in chief, yeah, the witness statement generally stands as evidence in chief, with me, which means in the litigation, you don't lead evidence in chief. The only, the only um, wit witness evidence in chief is simply, generally simply to ask the witness for their name, to confirm that it's their signature, to check whether there have been any changes or amendments or corrections to their report, to their witness evidence, and then to hand over to opposing counsel. And I say generally because there are situations where some arbitrations, the tribunal does want witness evidence in chief. Um, I've had, particularly in public international law disputes, I've had a number of uh, international law disputes where uh, international law disputes generally move much, much slower than commercial arbitrations. We're talking years between each submission. So a witness may have submitted his witness evidence 
eight, nine, ten years previous to giving testimony. Sometimes in those situations, an, an arbitra arbitration tribunal wants to hear the witness, wants to get a sense of what the witness is saying through evidence in chief. So in certain situations, it might be the case, but generally, uh, evidence in chief is witness statements. Moving on, expert evidence. Jack, do you want to do you want to pick that up? Sure. Um, so, um, I mean, the, the the points in the slide really kind of speak speak for themselves. First thing, do you need an expert? Is the claim so complicated, or is there areas which are which are better suited to to have a neutral person uh, describe them or give evidence on them? Not always. Um, uh, experts, which we often use. Uh, in arbitrations tend to be where there's um, issues of quantum, uh, where there are is where you have a contractual dispute, where there are issues which have affected what you call the critical path of the project. So for instance, you need a delay expert, which is someone who will look at all of the project documentation and then give evidence uh, on, on how the critical path has been affected. Um, as, as English law practitioners, often we, uh, in English seated arbitrations, Occasionally, you have uh, experts on foreign law, but that's typically more in litigate in arbitration related court proceedings. Um, in picking an expert, again, you want to make sure that they are credible, they have the correct qualifications. Um, have they given evidence before? I've uh, uh, had an expert. I had it, it was a, a a VAT dispute, and we needed to find an expert in VAT in this particular European country, and we found a great expert. But the problem is he'd never given evidence before so it was it was a challenge to make sure that he was properly prepared and it's always a gamble when you're instructing an expert who's not given evidence before so if you can find someone who has testified um independence is probably the the cornerstone of expert witnesses they have to be neutral um they're not there to be um your a microphone for the client or for the claimant or for the respondent they're there to present to the tribunal in a neutral way their opinion on a particular area of law or in a particular sector uh, and the tribunal will value an expert who comes across more neutral and independent than someone who's just who they think is just arguing the the, the case of their appointing party um can I pick up on that, Jack? Um, again, that comes to legal traditions. Um, we have a case on at the moment involving Saudi parties. And the way litigation normally works in Saudi is that the court appoints an a neutral expert. That expert is then um, ultimately an expert determinant. And the judge generally, not always, but generally will follow what the expert suggests. That means that experts working in the Saudi context have a proper Neutral an understanding of neutrality that goes to the fact that they are appointed by the court. They don't take sides either way. That's one extreme. The other extreme is certain jurisdictions. Um, again, the U.S. is one of those, where experts are expected to only put forward the arguments that are favourable for the client that's instructing them, and not to address arguments that are unhelpful for the client that's instructing them. Now, from my perspective, I would say that that would mean an expert is perhaps slightly biased more for the client instructing them rather than not. But in the US context, that's required. So again, you have a situation where you have different types of experts. What, what if a situation where you have a Saudi expert versus a US expert, two different experts appearing before a panel? Two completely different approaches as to what it means to be an expert. And again, that's something that a skillful cross-examiner would then need to pull out during the cross-examination. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the issues of privilege over instructions to expert. Simply put, what that means is, um, depending on your jurisdiction and the seat of your arbitration, um, your instructions and your correspondence with the expert can potentially be disclosable. So if there's something in the expert's report which gives rise to the other side saying, wait a minute, you know, why, why have they been instructed to answer, ask X, Y, Z? or the way that they've, they've recounted their instructions doesn't really kind of smell right, you know, potentially you could, you may be asked to disclose your instructions to the expert. So what's important when you're preparing the instructions is, is you prepare them on the assumption that you could disclose them, especially as an English law petitioner, that's what we recommend. So, uh, you know, the instructions have to be very clear. They have to be fair. You're not asking them to fight the case or to, to make sure you get a win for the client. It's about, it's about putting the instructions um, as clearly as possible, but always bearing in mind that you could be asked to disclose those if ordered so, or ordered to do so by the tribunal. 
Um, can I pick up a point on pliability on the third bullet point? So that's independence versus user friendliness versus pliability. By pliability, what we mean is whether the expert is willing to agree with any position that the client puts to them. My own preference is that I want an expert who says no to me, who says to me, Greg, I'm not arguing that position because I don't believe in it. If you want to, that, that is not correct. That's not the right way. I personally want experts that will say no to me because that means that if they say no to me, they would be willing to be very robust when giving cross-examination. And from my, in, in my experience, robustness of cross-examination and an expert's ability to come across as credible and independent in cross-examination for me is absolutely crucial. If there is an expert saying, yes, 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 Greg, I'll, I'll, I'll argue any point you want me to. That to me suggests that the expert might not be the best person in cross-examination because they can simply crumble, they can say anything. And I've personally had a situation where we were providing expert evidence on a Middle Eastern law. The expert on the other side was arguing that the type of lost profits that my client was claiming was not permissible under that particular Sharia law. Uh, so an extremely complex point. We had a number of experts, various, various sides, but this particular expert was saying for the purposes of his client that the particular type of Sharia law of this jurisdiction did not allow lost profits. Sorry, did, did allow lost profits. Sorry, it did allow lost profits. Our argument was that it did not allow lost profits. We felt it was slightly unusual that this expert was saying that Sharia law in this situation did allow lost profits because from what we were told, Sharia law in this jurisdiction certainly did not. And it was an unusual argument even to say that it did. So we investigated the expert that the other side had. And we found that about 15 or so years ago, that same expert has, had given testimony in a local court to say that Sharia law did not allow lost profits. So what that essentially what that expert was doing in that local court 15 years ago, he'd given testimony which was precisely in favor of my client and directly opposite to the client that he was now um, instructed by. What did we do in that situation? We didn't disclose in advance that we had this document. We used it for the first time in the arbitration. We put it to him in his cross-examination without telling him in advance that we did. The other side got very angry because we were looking to hijack the arbitration. We were looking to ambush him. We, the other side got very, very upset. Ultimately, the tribunal allowed us to get this document in because it went to the credibility of the expert. And because it was so serious, it went to the credibility of the expert. It became pretty clear to the tribunal that the expert was simply saying anything that his, part, that his instructing client would pay him to say. And his, ex, his credibility was completely shot. As a result of that, the tribunal primarily ruled in my client's favor that Sharia law in this instance did not allow for the lost profit that was being sought. So that's an extreme example, but it's an example of what happens when you have an expert who is too pliable, who is not willing to stick to his ethical position. Um, Everyone's favorite topic. Okay, uh, document production. So document production, um, in the US, it's called discovery. In English litigation, it's called disclosure. In international arbitration, it's called document production. This is basically, how do you get documents from the other side? Um, there's, in, in, in most types of arbitration, there's an understanding that your opponent may have documents that are either relevant to the opponent's case or alternatively relevant to your case, which you don't have yourself, but you need to get hold of them. Uh, so that's the process of document production. The first thing to do is assess where your own client's documents are located. Um, the important point here is to advise your client to preserve their own documents because they may be asked in an arbitration to produce documents. If they don't produce documents, then the arbitral tribunal might decide that the other side is, that your client is hiding documents or your client is willfully avoiding producing documents that might be helpful to the other side or unhelpful to your client. Um, once you are looking at the memorials, so we spoke about the memorial system earlier, you have your statements of claim, your defense, 
That's the first two submissions, then your reply and your rejoinder submissions. Usually after the statement of defense is filed, so after each party has had one opportunity, statements of claim defense, after the defense is filed, you have the opportunity for document production, which is at a point that each party can ask the other to produce documents um, that are relevant and material to the, to the dispute. They need to be relevant, they need to be material. You can't ask for a million documents and a million different things because the tribunal will refuse to order those sorts of, um, that, that sort of document production. When you ask for documents, they need to be sufficiently detailed. You need to explain what the document is that you're looking for, why you're looking for it, and why it's relevant and material to the dispute. The important point here is not to ask for everything. The important point is to focus on documents that you really need to prove your client's case. Don't ask for everything. You don't need to exhibit every document because if you don't need to ask for every document, because if you do ask for every document, what you're doing is you're going to lose the tribunal's attention. If you put in a request for 500 different documents explaining for each of those 500 why each particular document or category is relevant and material for each of those 500, you're going to lose the tribunal if you're asking for 500 different documents. If you're asking for 20 documents and you explain the relevance and materiality of each of the 20, I can promise you the tribunal will give that far more attention. It's not that they won't give attention to 500, but it's just human nature. If you're faced with 500 questions, it might your the attention span of the tribunal might be limited somewhat. Um, and and just to add to that is that you know document production. It, it's it, it can be a lot of work and it can be quite an expensive and time consuming phase of the arbitration, but it may be the turning point in the dispute, you know, well, first of all, in the submissions that you make when you are uh, ask requesting and objecting to documents, you the other side may make submissions, which you can then attack, they may say things about their case about what's important, about what's what's not important, um, about their own submissions, about your submissions, which then you can open up when you come to reply submissions. And it also may be that you end up getting documents which which are like the smoking gun, which 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 change everything about the case. So it's it's a hugely critical uh, part of the, the arbitration. It's just a very complicated and it can be quite time consuming. So it's important that you know it's not just left to the most junior people in the team and actually the the, the the people who are focusing on strategy the senior people are looking at this carefully and thinking what are we saying am i just leaving the submissions on document production to the most junior person uh, because that's happened where we've been on the other side to a dispute and the submissions on document production were done but clearly not done by by the partner in the team and we just saw all sorts of things that they were suddenly saying about their case about what wasn't their case, about what was the case, which then we decide, well, let's attack these. Why are they saying that this, this happened and this didn't happen? Why you why have you suddenly started referring to advice you've received? So it, it can really be a turning point of the case, although it's not necessarily the most interesting point, but what comes out of it can be very interesting. Um, there's also an interesting point here, the, the final bullet point, sanctions for failure to comply with tribunal orders. So the way document production works is claimant or each party asks for documents, the other side either voluntarily agrees to give documents or objects to the request. If the other side objects to the request, the tribunal is then asked to issue an order. If the tribunal orders the party to disclose the objecting party, the objecting party, if, if the tribunal orders a party to disclose documents and the party doesn't want to disclose the documents that has been ordered, by the tribunal, what happens in that situation? Here, we're, remember, we're in an, before an arbitration tribunal, we're not before a court. So if a, if a court orders you to disclose documents and you refuse or you fail, potential contempt of court proceedings. That doesn't happen in an arbitration. If you refuse to um, order documents that the tribunal has asked for, there is what they call adverse inferences, which is the tribunal can then reach a conclusion that the document that was withheld was unhelpful to the party's case. The question is how far that ultimately takes the party. Will a tribunal find that a party is liable on the basis of documents that have been withheld simply because the tribunal finds that those documents were, uh, were unhelpful to the party's case, but without seeing documents? It's unlikely a tribunal will find liability on, on the basis of documents that it's never seen but it can persuade a tribunal psychologically one party's got something to hide. 
And as soon as the tribunal thinks, well, one, one party's got something to hide, what are they doing? What are they not doing? That changes the tribunal's perception of the two parties. So even if you may not have uh, contempt of court proceedings, you may not have powers of compulsion, you may find that it's a risk worth taking to refuse to provide the documents that the tribunal has ordered, don't forget that that can critically change the tribunal's assessment of both parties, which party is in the right in this situation. And we've certainly seen situations where one party taking the wrong approach in document production can ultimately change how the tribunal sees the parties. Uh, if there's nothing, no questions on that, should we move on? Yes. Hearings. Right, this is the, my, my personally my favorite part of being an arbitration lawyer are the hearings. Uh, the hearing is where ultimately everything happens. You sp you've spent a year on the arbitration. You've submitted four memorials between the two parties, loads of witness statements, loads of expert reports. You've got two weeks in the diary for a hearing in a random hotel in somewhere else that people flying in from all over the world. The hearing is where it all happens. And from the arbitral tribunal's perspective, I can say that so many times I've been in a hearing and things have crystallized for me as a tribunal member, which hadn't crystallized during the me reading the party submissions. So from the arbitration's perspective, I think hearings are absolutely key. And if the tribunal thinks hearings are key, then they need to be key for the lawyers as well. It's not just about putting everything down in paper in your documents. It's about being before the tribunal, having the opportunity as a lawyer to convince the tribunal that your client is in the right and that the other client is in the wrong. Do you want to pick up on some of those points, Jeff? Yeah, so um, early preparation organization, obviously key. Um, you will have that date in your diary for, as Greg says, a long time. You know when it is. Uh, the other side knows when it is. And often the, the people who do best in hearings are the people who've prepared the best and prepared early. Um, we have... Uh, through technology, we have a, a wide range of types of hearings. You have um, in person, most hearings where you have cross-examination of witnesses are in person. Uh, procedural hearings or sort of small, you know, shorter hearings tend to be uh, virtual. I had a hearing uh, last, uh, actually earlier this year, which was, um, uh, it was a final hearing across a few days and the witnesses gave evidence uh, from their home jurisdiction remotely, and the lawyers and the tribunal were in the same room, which is quite an interesting because you have that you have that hearing dynamic where you had the kind of the adversarial nature of the proceedings, but the witnesses were appearing on screen, and it's very difficult to. You know, I, I think we found it quite difficult to cross-examine people um, remotely. Some people prefer it, some people doesn't matter, but I think to, to be able to have someone in the same room as you, to have them react in real time to your questions and you looking at their body language, there's all sorts of things which make in-person hearings, uh, you know, I, I prefer them anyway. Um, which what could you also mean, just to come on that, if you are, if you think your witnesses are not going to be very good and you don't want them to be cross-examined in person, you can push to try and get a hybrid hearing or a, a virtual hearing for strategy reasons. So there's a strategy point that comes in everywhere. Sorry, Jack, continue. And, 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 and that goes back to party autonomy, which is that if the parties agree, or, or you know, th th then you can curate a hearing however you want. There's no right or wrong way to have a hearing. Some tribunals may be more forthright and want in part, everyone there in person. But as Greg says, it's a strategy thing. If, you, if a witness is, can't be available for a hearing for whatever reason, then often they do find themselves giving evidence. And, and in that hearing, the fact witnesses gave evidence remotely and the expert witnesses flew to London and gave evidence in person. So, you know, each, each hearing can be, can be quite different. Um, you want to prep your opening statement and submissions. That's the most important. It's your hook. It's you know, it's how you get your tribunal to listen to what you say. It's your it's your opening shot. It's where you set out your case orally for the first time. You've had a chance to crystallize all the issues. You know, you want to make sure you're on top of every document um, and and all your submissions, and also be prepared to deal with difficult questions. You know, I've certainly had um, a, a a hearing where the tribunal asked tons of questions and you know sometimes the tribunal just sits back and listens and only ask a few questions but other times you know they'll interrupt your flow and the whole thing will just be just be a question and answer session with the tribunal um cross examination but you do have situations so we mentioned earlier about the dynamic of the tribunals and possibly one tribunal member being perhaps more partial than the others 
it certainly does happen that that imbalance comes out in hearings because the trib one tribunal member will interrupt occasionally. It's unfortunate it does happen. They will interrupt, they will try to avoid or try to prevent the flow and the ease for one party, but not do the same for the other party. And I think all our, all International Arbitration Council have unfortunately seen that. Yeah. I mean, it may be also that a tri one tribunal member has a particular interest in one of your submissions and may have their own view on it. So they're kind of sat there trying to tease out with you what, you know, what, you know, they may have their own, they already have formed their own position, their own idea about a particular point or a particular submission. And so that is also, in that context, you may also have uh, a kind of backwards and forwards with one tribunal member where they, you know, have a particular interest in the, the last uh, example of VAT law. So they may be, they may have a particular personal interest in that. And that's something to be prepared for. You know, you may not know that topic better than the arbitrator who's asking the question. So again, it's some, again, it's why preparation is key and, and being kind of as, as being, being um, prepared to answer those sorts of questions. Um, Cross-examination of witnesses, well, the way that I, I do it is that we do it, often you do a script. So you will look at your um, other side's witness statement, um, put down all of the questions you want to ask them and all of the answers that you expect to, to get. Because, you know, I think cross-examination is, um, it can be, it's very psychological and it, it can be that you are asking questions where you know that you're not going to get the answer you want so there's 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 it's very difficult to plan ahead but also you don't want to prepare a whole line of questioning maintain that and keep pushing at it when there's just simply no you're never going to get an answer that is the, the answer that you want and you end up just going around in circles with a witness wasting your very limited time on, on a line of questioning which ultimately was is going to be fruitless so um you never know until you're there but again, it's important to prepare and have a script in terms of the exact questions that you're going to answer and, and a kind of decision tree. You know, if, if yes, go to this, if no, go to that. So, I mean, that, that's the way I do it. I don't know if Greg does it slightly differently, but that's how. Um, I, similar approach. I think the, the important thing here for cross-examination of witnesses and experts, particularly for witnesses, you only really ask questions if you know what the answer is going to be. And you, your questions are then designed to pull out from the witness answers that you want to get before the tribunal. So you don't ask the witness everything, you only ask the witness things that are helpful for your case or unhelpful for their defense. Um, the other thing with cross-examination is flexibility. There's no point, as Jack said, going down a route where it's not working, you're digging a hole for yourself. The, the idea is to be flexible, to be one step ahead of whatever the witness might say at any point. And the only way to do that is to have preparation. Without preparation, you would be completely lost as um, with any cross-examination. Um, and it's the same with experts, but it's slightly more of a dialogue or a discussion between the experts. The experts, it's less of closed questions, yes, no answers. But with experts, there's much more of a discussion. Um, it might be the case that the expert is taking a perfectly valid and perfectly legitimate position, which your own expert may disagree with, but it doesn't mean that you automatically need to cross-examine that expert to the extent that you try to rebut and destroy his evidence. Mm -hmm. It then is up to the tribunal to decide which of the two experts is um, it believes more. Um, and we've had a practical question, which is how, do, how are documents dealt with in virtual hearings? So it's the very bottom point, which is the bundles is often the most important part and often prepared by the most junior person. But often you will prepare the bundles, which will, uh, you know, you'll know from litigation will just be almost all of the documents in the case. Um, sometimes a, a, you have an agreed bundle, which is where, you know, you agree with the other side what's important. Sometimes the tribunal want a core bundle, which will contain the most important documents or, or, or the most important submissions. Um, and in terms of how, you know, in terms of how you deal with that, uh, they'll be created often electronically. They'll be sent out to all of the witnesses and all the parties and the tribunal shortly before the hearing. And like I'm doing here, someone will be sharing screen and showing taking the witness uh, through the documents or taking the tribunal through the documents. Um, some people like to do PowerPoints um, with the key documents, kind of, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the way I did it for closing submissions in one case is we had a PowerPoint and then we had we're taking the tribunal through a contract and then we we had enlarged the area of the, the the particular clause in the contract that we wanted to make submissions on which made it a lot clearer for people watching remotely 
Um, so I hope that answers that question on, on how do you deal with documents in, in virtual hearings. Um, just to add to that, they're, yeah, they're usually PDF'd and what happens is that the parties will, the lawyers and the parties will agree on, a, um, on an index of all documents, an electronic index. They'll agree on the PDFs, they'll agree on the bundle between them. Once that's all ready, the PDF will be sent to the tribunal or the, 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 the folder structure will be sent to the tribunal with all the PDFs to download. But more and more, we're finding that there are electronic service platforms that provide that. Uh, Opus 2 is one of those platforms. Epic is one of those platforms. There are many others. What those platforms do is that they provide a location for a home for the documents. Quite, I find them quite useful because instead of carrying around 50 different files, everything I need is available for me on the cloud. Quite often what those platforms allow you allow one to do is that if you're running through it, if you're searching through a document, you can highlight, you can annotate, you can put notes on a document. And those highlights, those annotations, those notes are only viewable to the person that's put them in, which means that when I'm, when I'm preparing, I can put my own notes into a particular document, which means that the other side doesn't see what my notes are, but I see what they are. Um, so there are, there are many IT ways of doing that, but they are, they are very useful. Um, I think we need to be moving on a bit. Yes, let's catch on. Yeah. Right. The award. This is where it all. This is where it all culminates. Um, the most important thing, and this is something you need to think of from the start all the way through and right up to the end of the hearing. From the start of the arbitration all the way through to the end of the hearing, what is it that you're asking for? What is the award that you want? Do you want declaratory relief? Do you want an order for the other side to pay money? Do you want an order for specific performance? The reason that these are important, the first point that we've said before, it is only against the other signatory to the arbitration agreement that any award can be issued. So declaratory relief would bind only the parties to the arbitration agreement. That only your declaratory relief relates only to parties A and B. Party C, who's outside of the arbitration agreement, has no has no um, there's no effect for party C on declaratory relief. An order for the payment of money it needs to be very specifically worded. It needs to be very clearly expressed. Again, specific performance it needs to be very very clearly worded, very specific. Quite often, a tribunal will give an award with relief that isn't precisely what the parties are looking for. And the reason for that is that the tribunal may feel that the parties are going are, are looking for relief which is beyond what the tribunal wishes to order and the tribunal may row back its relief slightly. Um, the award may be final or the, the award may be interim. I don't think we need to talk about enforceability of interim awards as we're running out of time but the point is that there's a number of different ways an award can be um, can be issued. Um, is there a fixed timetable for a tribunal to render an award? In theory yes. Um, in practice it depends. Some arbitral institutions impose a requirement that an award has to be issued within six months after the receipt of the file to the tribunal. Others allow that six month period to be extended or whatever period that is to be extended. Some arbitration institutes impose a costs penalty on the arbitrators if the arbitrators don't render an award within time. And an example of one of those proceedings that I've just very recently finished is expedited proceedings under the ICC. I was sitting as sole arbitrator the ICC requires that a sole arbitrator must issue the final award six months after the file has been transmitted to the sole arbitrator. And if it isn't, if that award isn't issued within six months, then the arbitrator's fees are reduced. Uh, and there's no extension for that six month period. Whereas in normal ICC proceedings, there is an extension and there's less of a penalty. So it's clearly an, a strong impetus on me to make sure that the procedure allows me to enough time to draft the award to give it to the ICC and to get it issued within six within six months. Um, and then we look at challenges to awards. Uh, Jack, do you want to do you want to pick up on that? Sure. I mean, as it's clear there, grounds vary depending on the jurisdiction and the seat of the arbitration. Um, some are quite expansive. Uh, some jurisdictions have quite expansive grounds of challenge. Some are very narrow. I mean, take a narrow jurisdiction. I think we talked about it a lot, but this, this, the Swiss courts is a very, very narrow uh, uh, um, grounds on which to challenge an award. Um, in England and Wales, you have um, basically three points, uh, uh, three grounds of challenge. 
uh, challenge to the tribunal to substantive jurisdiction, um, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a sec, challenge on the grounds of serious irregularity and appeal on a point of law. Challenge to tribunal substantive jurisdiction, section 67, that can result in a complete de novo, i.e. do everything again, hearing uh, of the dispute. So if you have, have if the uh, person, the, the party challenging the award wants to, they can raise issues, which means that the court can look at anything related to the ground of objection of jurisdiction, which means that you can have a hearing on issues which already have been heard in the context of a jurisdiction uh, uh, matter in the arbitration. Um, and the uh, remedy is also quite severe, which is that the courts can uh, order the award to be set aside if they find that the tribunal has acted outside of their substantive jurisdiction. The same is not quite the same on serious irregularity, which where the presumption is to remit the award to the tribunal for if you know for changing. But um, again, and um, you know, time of the essence. Uh, I see in the, the new act in Nigeria, it's three months to challenge an award to, to apply to set aside. Twenty eight days in England. You do 29 days, you've lost the chance. So if you're a if you have an arbitration seated in London, you have very little time to read that award, work out whether there's a ground of challenge, file that and serve it on your well, the service comes after, but to put your challenge in within 28 days, if it's a you know, you could have a 300, 500 page award and you have to uh set out very clearly what your grounds of challenge are within those 28 days, and it can be quite difficult. Um you may there are exceptions to that, though. Sorry to jump in yeah. here, Jack. Um, there are exceptions to that, though, and one of them is um, for various reasons under the court. The court would seize it in the interest of justice to extend that twenty-eight day period. A dispute that everyone on this call will know, which is the PNID decision, that's currently working its way through the courts in England as a Section sixty-seven, a de novo hearing. The court extended the 28-day period to a number of years for various reasons that we won't discuss here. But the point is that that is now going through the English courts at Section 67 at an over hearing. Uh, time, the court held that time is, was of the essence, but was allowed to be waived for a number of reasons. Uh, interestingly, that is my firm. That is our firm, Mishkan Zareya. We're acting for the federal government of Nigeria. On that case, um, the award hasn't yet been issued, or the decision hasn't yet been issued. There's not much we're able to say about that. Um, th there's a question, which is, can an award be re be revisited by the same panel? And if yes, in what instance? So that would come under Section 68, which is remittance to the tribunal. So <clears throat> if the court finds that the, there has been a serious irregularity in the proceedings, and that can be anything from uh, they've made certain procedural decisions which are wrong, or they calculated the quantum incorrectly, uh, that means that the court can order the award to get sent back to the tribunal who will then have to correct it, correct the award and reissue it. So that's the circum sorts of circumstances where the award will go back to the same panel. And, it, and unless there's any particular reason why, it will go back to the original tribunal which rendered the award. Should we, uh, should we move on? Let's move on, yeah. Uh, right. Enforcement. Um, very briefly, enforcement comes to the point that we've said right, right at the start. Where does the counterparty have assets? One of the reasons that international arbitration is so popular is because usually an international arbitration award is easier to enforce in another jurisdiction than a local uh, court judgment. And the reason for that is the New York Convention of 1958. There are 179, 180 something um, countries that have signed up to the New York Convention. And the New York Convention essentially requires each signatory state to enforce an arbitration award from another signatory state as if it was a local court judgment, which means that under the New York Convention, you can obtain an international arbitration award in Nigeria, and you can bring it into England, put it before the courts in England, and the English court would enforce that Nigerian arbitration award as if it was an English court judgment. There are some reciprocal enforcement um, treaties for international court judgments, but none of them are as extensive as the New York Convention. And the primary reason why international arbitration is so successful and is so widespread is because of the ease of enforcement. Um, and, and I should add relative ease, which is that relative. some countries have a very summary procedure and a very pro enforcement, and their arbitration laws are based on the uh, on the what we call the unsubtrial model law, 
Um, and for instance, that means that the courts may be very reluctant to review a tribunal's determination on the merits of a dispute. Um, and um, and as Greg said, it can be a very summary procedure in many jurisdictions where they just take the award, they check it's valid, as in it's it complies with the New York Convention requirements, and they and they say yes, it's enforceable, and they register it. Other countries, not so much. Um, you know, so for instance, where you have an award against a state-owned entity, um, it may be that all of their assets are in the country where you're trying to enforce it, but a some courts may not may find reasons not to enforce a particular award even though it's against a New York Convention state um, and the state is a party. So, you know, uh, again, strategy, uh, think about where you're going to enforce it in the end. Um, and then I think we are, final slide. Just one Sorry. point, there's a question that's come up. Um, can an award be revisited by the same panel? If yes, in what instance? Um, generally, if an award is remitted by a court from a challenge, the court, the court sends it back to the arbitral tribunal to, to review certain issues. In that situation, it has to be reviewed by the same panel. But apart from that issue, once an arbitration panel issues an award, the panel no longer exists. The panel becomes functus officio, the panel is uh, deconstituted and it no longer exists. Um, so generally, an arbitral award, what, 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 once, a, once, an arbit once an award is issued, it isn't revisited by the same panel, apart from corrections or where the court orders that. Um, so we've talked through the entire life cycle of an arbitration. We've talked through what are some, just an issue, a couple of the initial considerations that one would need to think about at all the different stages of the life cycle. Hopefully that's given you some idea of what the skills and um, knowledge base required of an international arbitration lawyer would be. But the question is, how do you start this on your side? How do you enter the profession? Um, I think the first point here is that there are basic qualifications. Those basic qualifications are a law degree, practicing, bar entry, depending on what the requirements of, the, um, of each jurisdiction are. And as we've said at the start, those are necessary, but they're not sufficient. And the reason they're not sufficient is because international arbitration as practice and international arbitration as theory and as principles are usually not taught at law school. And that's why additional education and additional, additional courses come in. Um, these sorts of courses I think are very useful. This is an example of one. There are many master's courses. There are many postgraduate courses that provide the, the type of information in a lot more detail with a lot more case examples, with a lot more, a lot more meat on the bones than what we've been talking about today and what your prior four sessions have been. Um, now, all of those educational, additional education and additional courses, again, they're, they're probably necessary, not always necessary, but they're, they're not sufficient. It is not the case that going through those courses Will, uh, will ultimately open doors to you. They, they can help to open those doors, but they won't open the doors themselves. So with that, the question is how you take the first steps. Um, it's a very, very difficult to answer that question. And I suppose a couple of ways we can do it is I can talk through my own experience. Jack can talk through his experience of how we got into the profession. Don't forget, this is only two, two experiences of practitioners. There are millions of practitioners and there will be millions of different experiences. My own experience, um, as, the, uh, the, as the president mentioned at the start of the, of the session, I was previously trained as, a, as an engineer. Uh, I then retrained as a lawyer. I joined um, a very large international law firm in the UK wanting to practice transactional law in construction because that was what I was doing previously. While I was in that law firm, um, I discovered international arbitration. I managed to convince the partners in the law firm at the time that I was in to allow me to work in the international arbitration department. From there, I got interested in international arbitration and that's how my career started. Um, quite relatively straightforward, but that did require me to get into the right firm at the right time and have, the right, have access to the right potential opportunities, which I then took. Uh, and I know, Jack, your, your entry into the profession was quite different. Yeah, it was quite, it was a bit different. So I didn't do what you call a qualifying law degree. So I didn't do an, an LLB or equivalent. I studied Arabic and Middle East studies at university. Um, I lived in Egypt for a bit. Um, after I finished university, I worked as a paralegal 
um, in a smaller law firm. I then, um, off the back of that, met someone where I ended up doing an internship um, at the ICTY, which is the uh, International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, where we were on the defense team for one of the people who were being tried there. Off the back of that, I saw there was a role in Mishcon in the international arbitration and private departments, which I applied for. I joined Mishcon as a paralegal in 2015. Um, and other than leaving for two years to do my qualifying law exam and my vocational bar course, uh, I've been here in the international arbitration team ever since. And that's um, all learning on the job. I joined as a paralegal um, doing, uh, working on, it was one uh, dispute, well, it was two disputes, but one client in an ICSID case and an LCA case that were running at the same time. That went on, I think it only finished last year and it started in 2014. So you can see how long these sorts of matters run on for, but, but that was that personal experience and that just learning on the job. That's the best you know, that's the best learning you can do. You can learn things in a classroom and it's helpful and it gives you a, the building blocks, but often learning on the job is, is the best way forward. So um, the advice I would give is, is find a firm which practices international arbitration. And once you're in, then you can, you can work at it and you can gain your experience there. And the final point to Benna before you, uh, before, before you come in is just simply to say that the NBA is offering some mentorship opportunities on international arbitration. And thank you everyone for your time and we have some time for questions. So so very quickly, thanks a lot, Greg. I'm gonna um, uh, finish um, with the compliments at the end. I'll invite Rachel in a second to ask one or two questions from the Q&A box. But I just wanted as a follow up from this point that's just been made around how you get into the profession. Cause I mean, the demographics of uh, the people on this session is very important. Uh, there are a number of people from far-flung branches who do not necessarily have firms in their localities that offer the kind of opportunities that you've had or that Jack has had. So what would you advise them to do? I mean, I, the, the ment and I'm happy you mentioned the mentorship opportunity, and we are very, very grateful to you for offering that opportunity. We're also exploring a lot in that respect, but what would you advise them to do generally if they wanted to get a foot in the ladder without necessarily having to go through a formal structured environment? Um, there are a number of opportunities for junior lawyers on international arbitration. There's a number of what they call young arbitrators uh, committees, young arbitrators organizations. I know there's recently, commend uh, the Nigerian Young Arbitrators or Association has recently started. Each of the international arbitration institutions, the ICC, the LCIA, ICSID, all of the international arbitration institutions have young arbitrator committees, have young arbitrator, um, young arbitrators forums and groups. The first point is to join those and to become active in those. Simply joining them, I don't think is sufficient, but becoming active, um, contributing, contributing to local discussions, contributing Nigerian arbitration law to the rest of the world is a very easy and a very good way to start because Nigeria is a it's a substantially important uh, jurisdiction. We've about we, we've just recently had the new Nigerian arbitration law coming in. The scope of the Nigerian international arbitration regime will change with the new law. There will be a lot of new developments on the in the Nigerian arbitration space. The rest of the world in arbitration needs to know about this. And a lot of that information can be disseminated through the young arbitration groups. People can join those. You can make a name for yourself as being somebody who understands the way Nigeria does international arbitration. I'd say that's the first step. Um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah I, I would add um, two things. One, um, read around. So for instance, there are mailing lists you can sign up for, Global Arbitration Review, um, you sign up for those emails, you get an e e email in your inbox every day, uh, normally about 9 p.m. of about five or six cases which are going on. And e it is a subscription only to read them, but you can find that you can find them elsewhere sometimes. And it just gives you a good idea to keep on top of what's hot in the arbitration world at the moment. Um, and someone raised a question earlier, which I think is important, but um, and I don't know how, how, how Greg feels about this, but moot courts are a good way to get into it. Um, so, for instance, this year, I was an arbitrator at the Vienna Vismut. 
um, it's uh, it, it's universities which sign up for, but there's tons of other mooting competitions all around the world. And I would encourage people who, if you're a student, to get into that, and if you are a practitioner, to see if you can be an arbitrator. You just need to be qualified in your jurisdiction and have some arbitration experience. So I, I would recommend both practitioners and students um, uh, to, to to get involved in mooting because it's it's not only does it help your own learning, but you are uh, helping the, the the future generations as well become interested in arbitration. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, Rachel, can you come in? We can take one or two questions very quickly before closing up. Um, thank you very much, um, Tobina. And thank you to Greg and Jack. This has been a really enlightening conversation. And I mean, the fact that you were able to answer the questions while you were making the presentations made sure that everyone was carried along you know, um, seamlessly. But I will just take one question. Uh, which I think wasn't answered during the presentation, said, assuming during interim measures, in order to prevent dissipation of assets, the tribunal holds that certain assets belonging to the claimant is the subject, um, yeah, belonging to the claimant. Is that subject to appeal or can it still be tackled during the arbitration proper? So if you hold that the, the assets belong to the claimant, is that subject to an appeal or can it be tackled during the arbitration itself? The, the, the question there is whether an interim order from the tribunal has res judicata effect. Um, the answer is no, it doesn't. Not the, depending on the um, depending on the, the, the seat of arbitration. But generally, I would say that an interim order doesn't have res judicata effect unless there are certain criteria that have been met, which depend on the on, on, on the seat of arbitration. Um, as opposed to an award between the tribunal, if the tribunal issues an interim award that holds that certain assets do belong to party A rather than party B, the award might have res judicata effect and prevent one party from arguing the opposite, but an order may not. Okay, thank you very much for that. I, I don't know, um, Jack, do you want to add anything? Um, I mean, the only thing I was thinking for, with my respondent hat on is that if a tribunal orders interim measures, it may be uh, that you can argue that the tribunal has prejudged an, an issue and it could open up to a ground of challenge. So uh, I, I have a case where they did order um, security for costs and that was a ground for you to challenge the tribunal. And it can also go to challenge the award later on. So you can say, well, tribunal, you've made a decision. You've decided things of fact, which you shouldn't have decided until you've actually received our submission uh, on the facts. So it can be as a respondent, it can be a good, uh, a, a potential ground of challenge. That's all I have to add on that. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, so that we are not, you know, um, overstepping with the time, I'd like to invite them um, to Vina to come in now and, you know, say thank you to everyone. And thank you, Greg. Thank you, Jack, again. Thank, thank you, you very much. First of all, Richard, thank you very much for handling question time. Um, now to our closing remarks. Um, Greg and Jack, I mean, I really don't know how to sum, up, sum this up, but what a brilliant conversation we've had this afternoon. Absolutely amazing. Very interesting. Very... Have you been nice on? Oh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, yes. I'll, start, I'll start again. I think perhaps I was cut off. But I was actually commend, commending uh, um, Greg and Jack for a brilliant presentation today. What an amazing conversation it's been. Uh, and uh, the style was very practical. Uh, I mean, very direct and speaking from experience all through. I'm sure that the, um, I can see from the comments, coming in from the comments box that uh, our members are very delighted and that they found it very insightful and very enlightening. Um, amazing. Thank you very much. I mean, I know uh, the conversations that went on before you guys came on, the fact that you were handling some cases from Nigeria and all of that, but you still uh, were able to take this on and cleverly navigate it without bringing in any sort of issues that could cause confusion. But thank you very much, Greg. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, thank you, Greg, for accepting to mentor uh, six Nigerian lawyers. It's a big ask, but uh, Thank you, and I'm sure they will enjoy it. We're still going through the paperwork. We'll submit the names to you in due course. And I'm quite excited at the fact that both of you have two different kinds of experiences getting into 
into the profession. And I'm sure that would be very encouraging, especially Jack's story to a lot of our members that uh, you can come in as an outsider and then become very good at what you do. So thank you very much. We're grateful. And I'm sure you will answer when we call on you again, because definitely we'll call on you very soon. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So uh, to the delegates, we're delighted to have you all here today. Uh, thank you for what you do. Thank you for participating. Uh, we'll circulate the slides uh, after the last session of the series on Wednesday. Uh, as far as the recordings go, they are all there on MBA, ICLE, the YouTube channel. So thank you very much for joining in today. The session, uh, the series continues tomorrow with an analysis of the new act by um, Mrs. Fumi Roberts and Dr. Chikwendo Madomere. Thank you very much. And, and I'm very particularly grateful to all the facilitators, including Greg and Jack. Um, it is in, I always like to mention that this is completely pro bono. They are doing it because they want to give back to the profession, give back to colleagues. And we're always delighted when we have people from other jurisdictions come to share their experience. Thank you very much. God bless you all. And see you all tomorrow.